quantum chip is super impressive. Freeberg and I were talking about that on the group chat. On Monday, Google announced its latest quantum chip. It's called Willow. Here's the chip if you haven't seen it. It's uh, beautiful. It was fabricated in Google's new chip plant in Santa Barbara. They started this project back in 2012, their quantum computing project. And the headline basically is Willow performed a standard benchmark computation in under five minutes that would have taken today's fastest supercomputers 10 septillion years or 10 to the 25th power, which is billions of times older than the universe. If you don't know what quantum computing is, Freeberg will expand on it, but basically computers are binary. You've heard this before, one and zeros. Quantums use qubits. You know, those are zero, one or both at the same time. And uh, Google got a a 5% pop. They're up 13% in the last five days. Probably on the other news that Gemini 2.0 is out as well, which is unbelievable. I've been playing with it. What do you think, Freebird, of this big announcement? Google's announcement is a paper published in Nature that follows a preprint they actually put out in August. So this news has been out for a little bit. There's obviously a press cycle this week around it to kind of make a big thing about it. But it is a very kind of important milestone in the evolution of quantum uh, computing. So do you want me to kind of talk about quantum computing again? I think we've talked about this in the past. Like, I mean, maybe a brief primer for people, but like, what, what does this mean practically? I think what people want to know is when did these yeah. things actually have an impact in the way, say, NVIDIA's GPUs have had? Yeah. The big breakthrough here is that the whole basis of a quantum computer is called a qubit or a quantum bit. It's radically different than a bit, a binary digit, which uh, we use in traditional digital computing, which is a one or a zero. A quantum bit, you can kind of think about it as a wave function. It's sort of a quantum state of a, of a molecule. And if we can contain that quantum state and get it to interact with other molecules based on their quantum state, you can start to gather information as an output that can be the result of what we would call quantum computation. And that sounds complicated, but what it really means is that instead of doing kind of binary computation where we're adding numbers together or doing kind of other traditional arithmetic, there are really interesting functions you can do with qubits. Qubits can, for example, be entangled. So two of these molecules can actually relate to one another at a distance. They can also interfere with each other, so canceling out the wave function. And then when you read it out, you get a, a result that is basically a very, very complex problem that is solved through this quantum interpretation. It's really hard to kind of highlight how different this is from traditional computing. So quantum computing creates entirely new opportunities for algorithms that can do really incredible things that really don't even make sense on a traditional computer. They're not possible to kind of resolve on a traditional computer. And sorry, let me just state one thing. The quantum bit needs to hold its state for a period of time in order for a computation to be done. And so the big challenge in quantum computing is how do you build a quantum computer that has multiple qubits that hold their state for a long enough period of time that they don't make enough errors that you can actually do a computation with them. So what Google was able to demonstrate here is they created these, call it logical qubits. So they put several qubits together and by putting several qubits together, they were able to kind of have an algorithm that sits on top of it that figures out, hey, this, this group of physical qubits is now one logical qubit, and they balance the results of each one of them. So each one of them has some error. And as they put more of these together, what they were able to demonstrate for the first time ever is that the error went down. So when they did a three by three qubit structure, the error was higher than when they went to five by five, and then they went to seven by seven, and the error rate kept going down and down and down. So this is an important milestone because now it means that they have the technical architecture to build a chip or a computer using multiple qubits that can all kind of interact with each other with a low enough fault tolerance or low enough error rate that they can start to do these quantum calculations. This is a, a, a big area of opportunity. One of the very interesting areas that a lot of people are talking about is in cryptography. So there's an algorithm by a professor who was at MIT for many years named Shor, it's called Shor's algorithm. And in 1994, 1995, I think around that time, he basically came up with this idea that you could use a quantum computer to factor numbers almost instantly. And all modern encryption standards, so all of the RSA standards, everything that Bitcoin's 
blockchain is built on, all of our browsers, all server technology, all computer security technology is built on algorithms that are based on number factorization. So if you can factor a very large number, a number that's 256 digits long, theoretically, you could break a code. And it's really impossible to do that with traditional computers at the scale that we operate our encryption standards at today. But a quantum computer can do it in seconds or minutes. And that's based on Shor's algorithm. And if you want, there's some great YouTube videos that describe Shor's algorithm and how it works. But it's like mind blowing when you look at it. It's like this really like non-intuitive but simple set of steps that when you put them together on a quantum computer, it's like this thing can instantly figure out all the factors and then you can break a code. One of the things that this highlights is that in a couple of years, theoretically, if, if Google continues on this track and now they build a large scale cubic computer, they theoretically would be in a position to, to start to run some of these quantum algorithms like Shor's algorithm. And so we're now kind of spitting distance or a couple of years, it's not really clear, is it three years, five years, seven years, but a couple of years away from having computers that theoretically could crack all encryption standards. And there are a set of encryption standards that are called post-quantum encryption. And all of computing and all software is going to need to move to post-quantum encryption in the next couple of years. So there's like this big kind of push now to like, how do we do that? How do we accelerate it? I saw Sundar post it. I saw it in my feed. I ended up missing my next meeting because I had to figure out how long will it take for us to crack the encryption standards that we use for Bitcoin. Nick, <laughs> here's the answer because I was so tilted by this idea. Mm. So... If you think of Willow as essentially like one stable, logical qubit equivalent in a chip, we need about 4,000 to break RSA 2048. And we need about 8,000 to, to break SHA-256, which is the underlying encryption framework for Bitcoin. So I think you're right. I think we're in the sort of like... The end game? two to five year shot clock. No, I mean, I think what'll have to happen is some of these chains will need to obviously re-implement something at a pretty foundational level. The weird thing as Freebrook says is like, the Willow chips error correction gets better the more of these things you start to use together. Now, there are some really big problems inside these chips, like logical interconnects are very complicated. If you put two chips on a board, like the C2C communication is called this, all this stuff that we haven't figured out how to do, mm. but this is a big deal. <laughs> and I was, I was really like, oh my God, what's going on here? Other projects at Google are finally landing. You have it's Waymo. It's really incredible. And you have this now. I mean, Project Loon might be gone, but you know, I think those projects, we're going to see a couple of them change the world. Yeah. Just to give you a sense on the numbers, like Google's target for fault tolerance on a quantum chip to make it logically useful is one times 10 to the negative six. Right now, this Willow chip is kind of running at 99.7%. So it's still a few orders of magnitude away. They have a long way to go in getting the fault tolerance low enough to actually build uh, logical gates using qubits that can resolve kind of computational output. And so there's still, there's still a build cycle ahead and that pathway is a little bit unclear, but what they've shown is this almost feels like the Shockley transistor moment. It's like, it, here's this exactly like, right. you know, here's you this, this transistor. Now everyone's like, you have a lossy transistor and then you'll figure out P injunctions. You'll figure out all of these ways of just like getting the error correction down. I, but by the way, this reinforces what you said before, which is it's hard for an outsider like us to comprehend what's really happening inside of Google because the business they built was able to fund this. I mean, and, and I, I went down a rabbit hole because I'd never heard of who this guy was that, that runs his helmet, Nevin. He's in um, Santa Barbara. They have a whole team in Santa Barbara. They've been running for like 10 years. He has his own law, Nevin's law. And then I went down the rabbit hole of that. But what's amazing is so valuable for humanity. Google had the money to fund him for the last 12 years. Exactly. And the greatest money printing machine of all time is paying dividends. Yeah. But isn't it great to know that Google takes these resources from search and sure, maybe there's waste and or maybe they could have done better with the black George Washington or maybe they could have done better with YouTube. But the other side is they've been able to like incubate and germinate these brilliant people that can toil away and create these important step function advances for humanity. It's really awesome. DeepMind is on that list as well. Keith, what are your thoughts? DeepMind, yeah. Yeah, yeah Deep so I, th I think 
First of all, I think there's a long time before this becomes a commercial product or application of any sort. So, you know, it's great that they're taking money, but think about it as like almost like Stanford takes money or the US government funds basic research in some ways. This is at least a decade out kind of thing. Um, there's another, I mean, I'm, this area way beyond my expertise, but I've been talking to a lot of smart people because I do do financial services innovation. And obviously, encryption is pretty critical, whether it's Bitcoin or other places. And th there's a couple concerns. One is it's not even clear that you can verify that this is true, um, by the way. Like standard computing, to explain sort of the magnitude of difference, standard computing would take uh, <laughs> right. 10 to the 25th years uh, to verify that what uh, Google analysis is accurate. So there's a right. chance that it's not even true. But for the thing, for the for the sampling test they ran. Yeah. yeah well, so right. the RCS, they think about that, 10 to the 25th number of years. That's the big, I think, hole in the whole RCS benchmark that they use, that it only is, it's a it's a framework that only a quantum computer could theoretically even So how do you know the answer is correct? <laughs> is, I guess, the and question, they, okay. if yeah, it takes be, that long to yeah. solve. <laughs> and then to be practical, like, so assuming you solve all this and it's accurate, and blah, 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 you make it fast, all Second, then there is the post quantum computing encryption, which, you know, a lot of people, a lot of things, a lot of important things have switched over to. So you have historical communications that were encrypted under an old paradigm that would be vulnerable. And, you know, every year that goes by, like the embarrassment level or the threatening level of old historical communications will probably have some decay function or some half life. So if it takes another 10 years, communications that were drafted 20 years ago, yeah, there'll be some embarrassing things and blah, 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 blah. But the more time it takes, the more safe, you know, sort of private communications and exchanges will be. Uh, so I think that's positive. Third is, there's a question of order of magnitude here. You mentioned you need like three orders of magnitude sort of improvement. Is each step function, you know, incrementally easier and faster? Or is each step function, you know, 10 years? And right. I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that. That's right. Mm. That's right. Yeah, a lot more work here to 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 be done. So Keith, you're not buying any quantum computing stock yet? Uh, not yet. We yeah. have looked at KB, you know, talk about like technology forward, you know, VCs. Over the years, I've sat through partner presentations and we've never really pulled the trigger. Uh, there's other reasons, like including like, even if you have quantum computing, you have to rewrite software on top of it uh, from yeah. a different, it's a completely different, you know, world. And who don't Nothing maps, nothing maps at all. Yeah. Nothing. So you're starting from scratch. Yeah. So you have an application layer, which might be actually an interesting business opportunity. Yeah. How are these things actually going to be coded and how are developers going to interact with them? If at all, maybe by that time, it'll just be AI. Running how do you the build code a compiler? Them. Who the hell knows? How do you build yeah. language properly? Uh, these are all complicated. Yeah. yeah who's going to write the basic? Who's going to write like the Microsoft basic? The interesting thing is there's a lot of work that's been done in this space. Like thinking about quantum computing and quantum algorithms is like an entire branch. People do spend a lot of time thinking about this and working on this and there are ways you can kind of simulate and test and start to build out models for how you could utilize quantum computers. But obviously we just don't have, you know, in industrial scale systems at this point. There was one interstellar Marvel Easter egg in their announcement that I wanted to get your thoughts on Freeberg. Google said that this massive jump in performance quote lends credence to the notion that quantum computation occurs in many parallel universes yeah. in line with the idea that we live in a multiverse. So is that somebody in PR is high AF or reads too much science fiction? Dude, you know, you know, the crazy Break this thing down for us. So the crazy thing about quantum physics is such a mind. F have you guys taken quantum mechanics? Like, I have not. I have. Yeah. I remember the summer I took it like the quantum, the first quantum mechanics class. It, and I was like, glad it was a summer course because you really have to like think like pretty deeply about what you learn in quantum mechanics. There's just nothing about it that's intuitive. Like the way we kind of think about the world is not the way the quantum world operates. In the case of a qubit, as soon as you measure the qubit, it collapses to a value. <laughs> if you try and measure it, if you try and look at it, it goes to zero or one. The probability by which it goes to zero or one is defined by, you know, the, the quantum state right at the moment you observe it. it it's just such a mind f So effectively, this thing is existing in a superposition in multiple states at the same time until you try to observe it. And that's the case of quantum mechanics. So what, what's kind of happening, I think, in that language, JCAL is nothing novel was kind of discovered or represented. That's just quantum mechanics. It's a mind f and you could go watch hours of YouTube videos if you want to like 
get taken down the mind rabbit hole of quantum mechanics and realize that, like nothing one is one thing i've always yeah. found fascinating about this discipline is that looking at a qubit changes it like it understands it's well, that's being true observed. for any particle there's a slit experiment and if you try and observe a light as a particle versus a wave it actually changes what happens what the the outcome is of it being a particle or a wave same with electrons the thing about quantum mechanics is the observation of a particle changes what happens serious question <laughs> serious question here Freeburg. it comes here it comes buckle in Freeburg. when you look at the the quantum buckle bit in. Do, can you get a better idea of the scale of uranus let's move or on no Let's move Let's on. Move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I saw Chamath was doing a joke. He was queuing up a joke at the same time. No, I was I was thinking about Schrodinger's cat. That's like a another yeah, tell, tell ridicu that one. Yeah. ridiculous thought experiment that when you, you it's go the same down concept. The, it's the, the same quantum, concept. The quantum state of the cat is it's both in the box and not in the box. And you don't know box. whether it's in the box or not know, until you open exactly, the box. Until you open the box. Yeah. And then you open yeah. the box and there's a X probability that it's in the box, X probability it's not in the box. But when when you don't see it, it's both. It's both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a cat lady you have three of those boxes and <laughs> i'm a dog person well we got more engagement from keith on that science corner than we have yes, from than david we Sachs ever in did four from years Sachs. so he's yes. more <laughs> he's yeah, yeah, more yeah. open no, no, to no, science no no, no in more fairness, stylish, in fairness, better on, bmi i need to i need funnier. to defend Sachs. they both said this is stupid and i'll never touch <laughs> it except keith was kinder and more articulate in getting <laughs> there he did that's right yeah, Sachs so would have right. just been snoring. <laughs> yeah, he would have yeah. done this. He would have he would have done his move where he goes stupid and then like <laughs> he would have done his next topic. There's an advantage yeah. of Monday partner meetings is I get to watch the science fiction stuff you know every week right. even if I don't yeah. really understand right. it. But like a decade of watching science fiction, you pick up some tricks. Exactly. Right. Do, you, totally. do you play chess with Peter Thiel while that discussion's going I don't on? Like play chess. Does? Actually, so I don't play chess at all. Oh, ever. okay. The reason why is if I do something, I want to be really proficient at it. And I don't have the time. Got it. Got it. Also, you have a life. You have a life. Yeah, right? I like yeah. to do so, like 